back to the basics. Um, I've thought a lot about what I want to talk about. My last video was, you know, it's all about the process. And in this one, I'm taking that, that idea of it's about the process. And I want to talk about a couple things that come along with that process. And what it really comes down to is first, <clears throat> it seems like self-doubt is extremely prevalent lately. Um, I probably spend more than half my time <clears throat> any day dealing with self-doubt for either myself or trying to lift and build people up, um, whether it's my students or family, whoever it is. But I feel like that, in it, and that's such an important part of our journey. Um, self-doubt is part of, is really part of that learning and growing process. And really, until we know who we are, until we have that firm, like, I know who I am, um, I think we're always going to lack that fire and passion that we either want or need. Um, so in this series, I'm kind of documenting that experience of that, that journey, I should say, that journey of becoming who I want to become. And I've done a couple things in my life that, that have really pushed me into my, to limits, uh, beyond my limits. And one of them was I, I joined the SPSCC jazz band and I'm terrible at jazz and I had a great experience with it. Probably not exactly the experience I originally set out to have. I'm a really bad drum set player, or I consider myself a bad drum set player. I should say that. Um, and I wanted to go and be a better drum set player. But the amount of drum set that I actually ended up playing was a lot less than I think I wanted to play. And I uh, ended up playing a lot more vibraphone, which was fine. But I didn't feel like... Yes, I grew as a vibraphone player. But I was hoping to grow as a drum set player. And I didn't speak up enough. And I, didn't, and I missed that opportunity for myself to grow. So in this one, though, we're talk I, I want to show you my journey as I, I've never been a soloist, and I want to show you that journey of becoming a soloist. So this video, I have a lot more, like, I'm going to talk about some practice stuff and show you some clips of me practicing. Um, but first, before we even do that, I want to start with um, George Hamilton Green. Um, so in the 1920s, George Hamilton Green, he wrote a series of 50 lessons, and which I'm like, that's a great idea. He would sell them for, I don't even know how much he'd sell them for, but you'd buy them and, and uh, every week you'd, you'd get a new set of lessons. And so these people were subscribing to, to these lessons. So 50 lessons, that's, I mean, even if you sold them for, I don't know, a dollar, 50 lessons, that's $50 for one person that's taking that. And George Hamilton Green was super famous and did a lot of really cool stuff. Um, but, but I'll, I'll get on with this. Um, but George Hamilton Green, he, he has this instruction book. Um, and so what, what, what I wanted to kind of point out was he has some tips for practicing and his tips are real. There's, there's some that are very specific to playing the xylophone. Um, so this is George Hamilton Green's tips to the xylophonist, um, you know, some of them are very, very specific to playing the xylophone, but some of them I, I feel really can be applied to any instrument. Um, so his, you know, the first four are all about really the xylophone, keeping your hands low when you're playing, um, always strike with the wrist, keep your hammers low. Um, instead of calling them mallets, they're called hammers. Hammer sounds way cooler. Um, but his fifth tip, always keep a steady tempo. And then he says, this is very important. Yes, this is very important. Keeping a steady tempo is really important. If you're going to play something slow, you have to play the whole thing slow. You can't just like play it slow and then fast and like and speed up and do all those weird things with your tempo. The sixth tip he gives is always give each note and each measure the proper amount of time value. For, for example, if you have one measure in 4-4 four, four time containing eighth notes and the following measure contains a whole note, both measures should re receive exactly the same count or same amount of time. Many pupils, in their anxiety to play fast, form a habit of not giving the sustained notes the proper amount of time. This is a mis this is a mistake which must be avoided. Um, I, I see that every day. 
we go into band and we play a passage. My kids know this. And I'm like, why did we play a half note only for a quarter note? They'll play at a certain tempo. They'll, you know, hot cross buns, hot cross buns, one penny, two penny, hot cross. And they, they keep your tempo the same. The quarter notes need to t- take up the same amount of time. Four quarter notes need to take up the same amount of time that you're holding out that whole note for. Okay. Um, the seventh one that he has, and and I am working so hard on this one right now. He says, when practicing, bear in mind that every note must be struck correctly. I realize that nearly every xylophonist has a desire to play fast. However, it is positively a waste of time to attempt to play fast at the expense of striking wrong notes. The secret of fast Accurate playing is nothing else than a thorough knowledge of the keyboard. So first of all, gain a complete knowledge of the instrument by striking every note correctly at a tempo slow enough to permit you to do so. Then as you become better acquainted with whatever you may be playing, you will be able to gradually increase the tempo and still strike each note correctly. I think that's a hard hard one as we talk about playing instruments is we oftentimes we we can glance over and say, well, I missed that. I'll get it. I'll get it later. And actually, one of my one of my favorite songs, um, Kevin Mahogany. I love Kevin Mahogany. Um, he, has a, he has a tune that it's called We'll Fix It in the Mix or something like that. And I love it because he's like, you know, things are going wrong. He's like, eh, it's okay. It's okay. We'll fix it in the mix. We'll fix it in the mix. In reality, if you don't practice perfection, you know, it, it's, it's not going to happen. You have to practice striking every single note on the xylophone correctly every single time. Um, if you don't, you, you start, uh, you know, I've always heard it like you have this like file cabinet in your brain. And every time you practice, you're putting another piece of paper in that file cabinet. And then the likelihood of you pulling out the right one when you've practiced so many times, and you've practiced wrong so many times that you pull out this piece of paper and you hope that it's the right one and it's not the right one. Well, if you're practicing correctly every time, you're practicing striking the notes every time the right way, the likelihood of you pulling out something that is correct is a lot higher. The eighth one practice tip in here is your success as a player lies in your ability to practice. To obtain results, you must practice. And the more you practice, the quicker the results. Practice makes perfect is an old cliche, but it but it is well to bear it in mind at all times. To develop good practice habits, decide on just how much time you can set aside for practice each day, and if possible, select the same hours each day. If you practiced two hours in the morning, by the way, two hours, I'm I'm like, when he talks about how much time he recommends practicing, I'm like, I don't got that time. So if you got that time, great, I don't have this time. Uh, He says, if you practice two hours in the morning and one in the afternoon, this would be an excellent routine to follow, providing you did it every day. If you're engaged during the day at some other vocation than music, two hours practice each evening and one half hour each morning before business hours would be fine. The main idea is to to devote all the time possible to steady practice and form a habit of doing the same amount each day. And do not let anything interfere with your practice. I have always advised pupils to practice a minimum of two hours. Form a routine and you will gain the quickest results. Now, the important parts that I take away from this. I, as as a middle school student, as a high school student, there's no way in this world that I had time to practice two hours a day. That is ridiculous. Now, if I wanted to be like George Hamilton Green, that's what it would take. I would need to take all that time. Um, but the parts that I took away from this um, were, first of all, to develop good practice habits, decide on just how much time you can set aside for practice each day, and if possible, select the same hours each day. It is so important to say, this is the time I'm going to practice, and nothing's going to get in the way. The second part that I like about this is he said the main idea is to devote all the time possible to steady practice and form a habit of doing the same amount each day. Pick a time and say, I'm going to put in 20 minutes of practice every day at, you know, five o'clock. 
I'm going to eat dinner and then I'm going to practice, or I'm going to practice and then I'm going to eat dinner. Whatever it is, pick a time and keep that time every time. The, the, the last one I wanted to talk about, he says, do not devote all of your study to popular or jazz at the expense of sacrificing the technical studies. Remember, in order to play good popular or jazz music, it is necessary to have a thorough knowledge of the instrument. And this can be obtained only through good, legitimate exercises and studies. So now he has this book. And in the book, there's a couple things. So in, in the little excerpts that I'm going to show you of my practicing, these are the things that, that you're going to see. So I'm, going to, I'm doing some just simple exercises. Um, it's a five-note scale. You know, do, re, mi, fa, sol, fa, mi, re, do. And I'm just going back and forth, back and forth. And his instructions on here. It says, repeat this exercise Three minutes without stopping. Keep a steady tempo. Three minutes is a really long time to go. Do, re, mi, fa, so, fa, mi, re, do, re, mi, fa, so, fa, mi, re. And over and over and over again. But what I found was at about minute two, my brain kind of goes into auto drive. And I start thinking about other things. And it just, and it falls apart. So if I can make it three minutes, I've, I've done it a couple times now where I've gone three minutes on this. And that three minutes, I, I have to, by, like by minute two, I have to reset my brain and refocus and make sure that I'm striking every note correctly every single time. Because for some reason at minute two, that's where, that's my attention span. Um, and so I do a couple of these exercises. I don't do them for the full three minutes in, in, in this, but... I at least give you an example of what the exercise is looking like, but um, it does. It goes like three minutes, and that's a really long time. But his book has these has technical exercises, but it also has technical ragtime exercises. So I kind of mix up a couple of these, and I just pick a couple this time and 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 work on a couple of them, and then I get into playing all the other stuff that that I have. So the rest of this is going to be I'm going to go through and and show you how I practice and enjoy the video. In this exercise, uh, this one was really challenging. This one was uh, this is exercise lesson one, exercise twelve, and what it was what it is is you're playing double stops the whole time, um, and you're just playing. Um, you know, your right hand is playing um, C the whole C for a whole measure, then D, and then E, and then F, and so on all the way up to C again. But your left hand is going down the scale, so go, starting on C, and you go down the scale C B A G F. E, D, C, then D, C, B, A, G, F, E, D, and so on down this 
Um, it was really hard to keep my hands together on this. And so I had to stop and you're going to see, uh, I have to isolate some things where I just, I stop and I start pulling out just one hand. Um, and then I go into, um, you know, playing C, 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 D, 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 E, 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 E. And then I start just going C, B, A, G, A. I'm just working my way down with my left, my left hand. Um, I do it with my right hand as well and have trying to isolate all those things. And that is so hard to do is to recognize that I need to stop and I need to fix this now because it's going to sound so bad. And I'm never going to get better at this unless I can isolate it. So I isolate it. Um, I believe I slow it down too. Um, but isolating, that's the first thing. When you run into a passage that you cannot play, you have to stop. You have to isolate that passage and break it down into something that is more manageable. Let's talk about xylophonia now. Xylophonia is the piece that I'm planning on playing for, as a soloist. This is going to be my first time ever being a soloist, and I'm super excited for it. Um, what terrifies me of it is, is my memory, and I want to make sure that I memorize really well what I'm going to be doing. Um, so what I'm doing in this practice session is I'm just trying to play slow. I know that there's I, I kind of mess with things a little bit here and there, Probably shouldn't have done that, but um, you know, if I'm to follow George Hamilton Green's um, advice, I, I need to be as true to it as I can. So, um, but this is I'm trying. I'm working on just that first page of the solo, just trying to make sure that I know what I'm doing and where all the notes are. I haven't really dived in that much into the notes on this yet, so there's a lot of mistakes, and I'm just trying to learn where everything is. Um, at the same time, it does. It doesn't sound terrible. So uh, take a look at this. See what I do. Let me know in the comments what maybe I should do different because I'm no expert. And I, yeah, I've gone to school. I have, a, I have college degrees in this, but that still doesn't make me an expert. Um, college degrees really don't make you an expert. They just, they just make you who you are and um, not necessarily an expert. I went to school with several people who I'm like, that's – you know, that's not, they're not experts either. And we all struggle just as much. So, um, and that's that self-doubt part, just so you know. So we're getting into that self-doubt now. All right. So um, take a look at this. What what do you see? And, you know, if leave a comment. I, I, I love to see the comments. And, um, you know, the last video I saw some, some of the comments were some of my past students who were just excited that I posted something. Or there, some of them are my current students. So leave comments. I like them. Um, I'll try and respond to them as I can. Um, 
but this is xylophonia.